um, I want to start by by uh, being grateful to Dr. Banks for the invitation and to Prof. Uh, Professor Murenzi, uh, because this connection, um, and as you'll see it in the slide, has um, had already started, but it is um, one that we value in, in Rwanda. Um, I thought I would start with just a quick understanding of um, the connection between government of Rwanda and Trieste, and then we'll zoom into ICGV um, collaboration. Um, so, you know, this sets the stage uh, very early in um, the connection that the government of Rwanda has with, with Trieste. And there's a visit that uh, occurred in, uh, by His Excellency, the president. And at the time, you'll recognize some of the faces there. Um, this visit took place um, in October 2014. And I believe it was the 50th anniversary um, of ICTP. And um, the, the, the visit was, was key in, in many ways. And later was followed by a second visit to Trieste by the then Minister uh, of the then Minister um, of, of Education, a uh, Professor uh, Ambassador uh, Murigande. Now you'll see a common thread here. <laughs> Professor Murenzi is in both pictures because Twas also has a connection with Rwanda. So we've seen ICTP, we've seen ICGB, but also Twas for the long uh, for a, a long-standing collaboration, or at least um, history with with the government of Rwanda. Uh, with that in mind, I wanted to now talk about specifically set the stage for why I'm here, right? As we just heard, it's a continuation of uh, initial high level visit. It's the highest level of visit you can get when you have a president of the country. And then you have the minister uh, come in and set a foundation. Um, and then I'm here more on the technical side to start seeing uh, the concrete steps. From, you know, we know that the government of Rwanda is in the final stages. I was joking earlier that it's any minute I may get a call <laughs> to say that the instruments have been, uh, are now in New York and, and we are good to go. But I wanted to start the stage with why we are here, right? So we can look at it as projects or we can look at it as a bigger picture. And I know when I speak with ICGBV, ICGB, you look at SDGs and it's the same approach that we have. Everything that we do is linked to social economic development. So I selected these six as some of the ones we would be working on together, right? There's zero hunger and good health, which is the third goal. And there's quality education, affordable and clean air, industry and infrastructure, as well as partnerships. So I have just a few initial, for you to understand the scope when I say government of Rwanda. So here are three institutions that are going to be linked to the center here. Mini Santé is the Ministry of Health and I work at the RBC. We'll hear a little bit more about the RBC and we are an institution under the Ministry of Health. There's also the Rwanda FDA, right? And then we also have Zero Hanger, which is which has to do with, with food security and, and food safety. So there's the Ministry of Agriculture and the Rwanda Agriculture Board. Um, the institutions are mentioning already in the room since 2021, I believe, the call that, that uh, Dr. Banks had um, had these, these institutions in the room. And then there's the Ministry of Education. We saw that the minister visited this center uh, back in 2019. There's the UR. I'll come back to talk about the University of Rwanda. And then there's another institution, Ines Ruhengeri. These are just uh, screenshots of institutions that... You know, and then we have the Rwanda Development Board, um, the National Industrial and Research and Development Agency, NCST is the National Council for Science and Technology that will work at least on two of these goals. And then there's the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and and um, and partnership on the partnership side for for goals. So why this picture? So you understand that I'm just from one of the institution of what will be a we hope a great collaboration. Um, now, if I zoom into what RBC does, um, this is a structure, but really it just means that, so we have the executive level and then we have the departments, two main departments, uh, one that is sort of disease specific. You'll see that all infectious diseases 
non-communicable diseases um, are under one roof. Um, the institution was created in 2011 by the merger of 15, 14 institutions at the time. So each of these programs could be standalone, but they've been brought into the institute, um, our organization. And there's also a biomedical services, which has the National Reference Laboratory, medical technology, we can read uh, blood transfusion. They are standalone um, uh, divisions. The reason I'm sort of giving a quick sort of overview is to say we do both the implementation of public health. Think of us as the national public health institution, but also a research institution. Um, we are delivering programs in terms of tuberculosis, malaria, HIV, uh, vaccination. And uh, we are also doing some discoveries. Um, and so I just kind of took three examples of from colleagues. Mm -hmm. One of the findings that was published in Nature is by first author Aline Wimana, who is in one of the division that looks at malaria and, and parasitic diseases. And she, she basically discovered the Artemisin resistant um, parasite in Rwanda. Now, it seems like a small publication or a small finding, but really what the WHO had been telling countries in Africa and beyond has been to uh, fight parasites such as mosquitoes. Um, these are these are some of the medications and artemisin based uh, medication and treatments are used widely. And so this finding was to say, wait a minute, we are actually starting to see mutations that are making mosquitoes resistant, right? So it's going to actually be leading to a policy review at, at uh, regional level and, and uh, global level, we hope. There's also a finding by Jean-Claude Semuto, who um, Gaonziza, who leads one of the other divisions of research, innovation, and data science. And so he, you know, he and his group discovered a complex. Um, I mean, we say African Great Lake region, but it, you know, it's in Rwanda and the uh, the region where they have a sister lineage of microbacteria. Uh, tuberculosis that was uh, uh, discovered in 2020. Now, the last sort of screenshot gives, it's it's recent, right? It's, it's the 15th of, of February of this year, right? So we're doing findings in malaria, we're doing findings in, in, in tuberculosis, but we're also working with global partners such as Ginkgo Bioworks. Ginkgo Bioworks has been known in biosecurity. Um, it's a US-based company that has worked with the CDC, uh, to track pathogen, pathogen variants. But the way it's done, it's done through airports. You, you know, you set up at a given airport and you do wastewater uh, surveillance as well as uh, random sampling of passengers. Why at airport? Because you get a great cross-section of passengers from all over um, the globe. So we just announced our partnership. We'll be working at the Kigali uh, International Airport. And we will be sampling a few flights a day. And it's all about tracking for this, you know, initially it's COVID-19 variants, but really the surveillance and pathogen of pathogen variants will be um, applied beyond SARS-CoV-2. Now it's kind of a quick overview of, you know, what RBC does. And we, so we talked about Trieste and the connection that we have here to key centers. We talked about, um, the ICGB collaboration and, and who is in the room when you hear government of Rwanda. We just did a quick uh, note on what RBC does. Now, let me kind of take a step back and, and talk a little bit about Rwanda, right? So, so as we talk about vaccine manufacturing, I wanted to start by giving some context. We know Rwanda, we know it's a small place in, uh, for many, it's a big place for us, but, right? <laughs> So it's approximately 13 million people. It's tough to capture the essence of a country, but we uh, we also mentioned that it's the top five uh, fastest growing economies in Africa. Why does this matter? It means that we are on a fast pace. It means that we are moving from least developing country to middle income country. And it's very, very relevant to um, the vision that the president had and everything that we do. So yes, I'm working in the health sector, but beyond me, we're talking about biotechnology, it goes beyond the health sector, and it implies also a contribution to the economy. Um, sometimes when you look at public health, 
um, the first question that you'll get is what's the vaccine coverage in your country? Because it tells you a lot about how the system is set up from primary level to secondary level to tertiary level. And so we have a 90 plus um, vaccination coverage. It means that with a childhood uh, vaccines and others, and yesterday I was mentioning the uh, HPV vaccination coverage that is as of 2020, was estimated to 98% um, of all eligible. Um, so it's for girls that are above 12 years old. And so girls and women. There's also another statistic that I wanted to, to highlight. Again, this does not capture the whole essence of what we're doing, but uh, the health insurance part kind of, you know, reminds us that we are an equitable country. And so it's about access, it's about affordability. So. Um, this is also an achievement that's been made in the country. And then we are a regional, we have ambitions to be a regional and continental hub. We like to say that, um, you know, we want to be among the heavy hitters, right? So you see how small we are, but the reason why we have these concentric circles is to say we, when we look at the country, we're looking really at the region and the continent. So whatever experience, experience expertise, capabilities that are built are serving broader than just the Rwandan community. Um, now, I wanted to do a quick, in terms of establishing context of why vaccine manufacturing, um, we know about global inequalities. We saw them very much so in the COVID-19 uh, vaccination. One of the headlines that I wanted to pull out says that Rwanda became the first African nation to use Pfizer. Now, I want you to look at the date of the 5th of March, 2021. <laughs> This is quite, it's early enough, right? It's probably three months into, so some countries started getting the vaccine in November, 2020, and then there's December. And then, you know, we were all fighting the same pandemic, but we didn't all have the same access. I want to do a quiz, if you allow. From this, you know, that says March, 2021, what do you think was the picture of COVID-19 doses administered per 100 people? Let's say Europe versus Africa. What would you say? A year later, let's say, what is today? 24th, let's say 24th February, 2022, which is a year after some of the first Pfizer and other vaccines were in Africa. 92. Europe will be- 92? No, currently 92 in Rwanda. 92 in Rwanda? No, I'm saying, uh, let's say Europe versus Africa. Okay, so Europe coverage per 100,000 people versus Africa's coverage, 100,000 people, 100 people, I mean. This is a picture. This is a year ago. Europe has 166.79. It means that each dose is counted separately. It means that in Europe, we're talking about booster doses when in Africa, only 28.27 people percent had had access. So uh, I'm just comparing two extremes, but it really kind of gives you a sense of why we do what we do and why it's important, right? You start from a place of inequality and you say, okay, is this, is this normal, right? It's not inequality just in vaccines. It's in vaccines, it's in diagnostics, it's in therapeutics. I highlighted a few numbers for you. Some of them you may already know, but I zoom in on Africa. Why Africa? <laughs> Unfortunately, um, up to 33, 40 countries in Africa are considered low, um, you know, lowest developed countries, right? Yet it's the second most populated continent with 1.3 billion people. It also consumes one out of every four <laughs> vaccine globally. But the next two highlighted numbers tell you what the problem is, right? So you're growing on one and you know, the estimated population growth in the region is 2.5%, which means we may become one of the most populated soon. But look at the availability of vaccines and medicines. These are just estimates. It means that 99% of every vaccine that's used, 95% of every medicine that's used in Africa comes from outside. Something is wrong here, right? So if we talk about increasing access to vaccines, diagnostics, therapeutics in African countries, you need something that's more sustainable than just acquiring uh, them from outside. So, you know, the, the last sentence kind of crystallizes why we do what we do uh, in terms of there's an urgent need 
for the continent to build this capacity. Capacity in research, capacity in production, capacity in distribution, that's also important. Now, if you allow, I want to now zoom into these flagship projects that we have for the continent. Um, you'll see that I don't just talk about Rwanda because the partnership that I'm highlighting with BioNTech um, was announced you know, in 2021, right? So you have a first, the reason I like to use uh, these, these sort of news titles, it takes you at a place in time where, you know, BioNTech said, maybe we should open an mRNA manufacturing plant in Africa. Two, this is December 22nd, 2022. Uh, it was the best birthday gift because this was my birthday. And by Antic announced, we're going to be shipping the first modular factory to Rwanda. Now, let me again talk about the speed, right? So we, we, we started with putting in context why it's needed. We're now looking at the urgency and why Rwanda has stepped in. This picture is a BioNTech roundtable in Berlin on the 27th of August, 2021. You have key people in the picture. You will probably recognize um, the European uh, Union Commission in the room. You recognize our president. You also represent, recognize the president of Senegal, uh, President Macky Sall. Let me turn on the pointer. And then you'll see Ogre uh, from uh, BioNTech and uh, uh, Mr. Holm Keller from Kenna. Now, this is a round table to say we're exploring bio manufacturing in Africa. We see, we see Rwanda and Senegal as some of the first countries that could welcome this new solution, right, of bio -entainers. So I want you to look at the dates, right? On the 27th of August, it's discussed. On the 23rd of June, 2021, there's groundbreaking. And I'm using a picture that has um, annotated. So from left to right, we have uh, Musa Fakri, who's the chairperson of the African Union Commission, because this is a Pan-African effort. We now have a president of Ghana that has come into the picture. Um, we have our president, um, His Excellency Paul Kagame. We also have Uber Shahin, which is, who is, of course, the CEO and, and co-founder of BioNTech. And we have Senegal, represented by the Minister of Foreign Affairs, and then two more guests. This was a very, very high level uh, picture. We have Dr. Tedros representing WHO, as well as, and it's important to note, Nicola Bellamo, who's the ambassador um, and head of basically EU delegation to Rwanda. Now you're seeing a multi-collaboration come together and putting this um, effort together, um, starting with Rwanda. But you have Ghana in the picture, you have Senegal in the picture. Um, the biontainer that will be coming, biontainer is the trademark term, a trademark term that, that, that was developed by, uh, by, by BioNTech. What's the intent? The intent is to say they have a factory in Malberg, Germany, right? And they want to work with an African country. Rwanda, walk, Rwanda walks in, Senegal is in the room, Ghana is in the room. And the intent is to say, can we take the factories in, in Malberg and reproduce it in an African country using a modular approach? What's the scope? We're talking about 12 containers, right? Six containers on one side, six more containers. Uh, the first six containers, which represent one module, are drug substance modules. And then there's this next six containers that will look at the, that will basically be used for drug uh, products. Here, there's some information around sizing and other things, but you know, this production, there's quality control. There is, uh, of course, local logistics that has to be involved, but you know, you have to set up a place that has to uh, to be able to house these bio antennas. And by the way, I think it's safe to to have this up because um, it was in the SEC filing that the BioNTech uh, filed. Um, so this is a single to multi-drug production. It's important to say that because yes, we're starting with the COVID-19 vaccines that are being produced in these two, uh, two sets of containers. And you know, from their own term and the way they present this, I thought it was important to hear it, um, that it's both the biontainers are going to be coming to Rwanda, another one in Senegal, Ghana, which appears here, and then South Africa are indicated as potential partners to fill and finish. So as you're producing the drug substance and drug products, if the fill and finish capacity is not available in the country, 
you then work with the partner country to fulfill these uh, capacities. Um, what are some of the focus? The focus is we want to accelerate knowledge and technology transfer. We're starting with mRNA technology, but you know it's it's one of the latest technologies. And if you're able to have it uh, uh, set up as a solution, uh, it is one of the fastest sort of knowledge transfer that can happen. Um, you you know it's it's setting up basically manufacturing nodes. Um, it's for pandemic preparedness for obvious reasons. One of the reasons why the project you know, um, took shape very quickly is because of the pandemic. There's also sustainability because the maintenance, the upkeep, everything is done locally. Um, partners will also contribute in, in, in many ways, in addition to being uh, sort of the knowledge uh, recipient and, and, and running it. The intent is when it's a full blown capacity will produce up to 50 million uh, doses a year. And uh, so you have the utilities, you have to provide the talent, which is one of the things that, um, again, the capacity building element is very, very important. There's a regulatory framework that's so important because remember, um, this is a system that was developed in Malbert, right? So you're putting it on containers, you're bringing it on the African continent, you're starting with Rwanda, and you have to show that it's basically reproducing the same conditions. And that's been an interesting collaboration with the, with the AMA, which is newly established African Medicines Authority with Africa CDC, with WHO. The sheer amount of collaborators that are coming around are, are, are just impressive and, and much needed. So it's actually a collaboration that's, you know, hopefully going to be leveraged in, in, and serve as blueprint for others. There's fill and finish capacity that you have to develop locally. And then there's a whole logistics and supply. Now that's a quick screenshot, but you know, cause, cause we've been hearing what is, what is a buy antenna? How are you going to set it up? So I'm giving you just a brief screenshot um, of, of how it's going to be. But I want to pause and say that it has to be integrated ecosystem, right? It's not just I'm shipping 12 containers in two separate modules, and I'm going to be producing vaccines. It, it, it's, it's bigger than that. Remember where we started, right? Remember that we have this collaboration. So as we look at the manufacturing, the manufacturing is along the path of research and development. Before that, there has to be the discovery, there has to be the research that then moves into clinical trials and after approval, so there's a strong regulation there, there's then production. There's also later distribution. So anywhere in the picture that we can um, collaborate with you, and this is what the intent was, that's what uh, this morning we had a session and there are a lot of areas. Um, any of these institutions basically will be ready to, to move in. So I thought it would be, again, it was, <laughs> I, I went by very, very, very quickly, but one of the reasons why I, I'm sort of circling back to why we are here is you now see a picture, but it, it goes beyond, right? It goes beyond the health sector. It goes beyond the RBC that's working with the Ministry of Health and Rwanda FDA to establish this capacity on behalf of the government. It goes to agriculture. It goes to the education in terms of capacity building, industrialization, um, and 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 partnership. So. I thought that was a lot of material to cover, so I wanted to leave enough time at the end for any any questions and comments. I want to thank you again. Um, this has been a, a, a wonderful short trip, but a wonderful one, and um, I very much look forward to populating this with with projects. Um, so thank you again. <laughs>